So please help me in welcoming Rajeshwar Upadhyay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. How is everybody doing? Super. So we're going to spend about the next 90 minutes or so uh, exploring the idea of emotional intelligence. Uh, what it is, what the implications of being emotionally intelligent are, and how can we enhance our own emotional intelligence, given the various dimensions of the subject. Research has it that 85% of all senior level promotions uh, is because of emotional intelligence. Do you think it is true or do you think it's a consultant's pitch for more business? 85% of all senior level success and promotions happen because of emotional intelligence. What do you think? Is it true? But if you notice, I said 85% of all senior level success, senior level promotions. Because at a particular level of seniority, your technical and functional capabilities are presumed. They are no longer differentiators. That you are good at doing your job is a given. Over and above doing your job, are you able to include, collaborate, empathize, relate? A large percentage of personal productivity goes up the moment you increase self-awareness. As you become more self-aware, you become more productive. Self-awareness is a very central theme in emotional intelligence. In a sense, everybody is emotionally intelligent. But to benefit from emotional intelligence, you have to be above a threshold level. You all remember your schools, right? In your schools, you would get marks. And there would be a report card. And uh, your teacher would give you the report card, right? And the report card would have all the marks. If you failed in a certain subject, the teacher presumed your father was colorblind and wrote it in red. And then she thought he might be too dumb, so she underlined it. So if you got 35 in maths, and 89 in English, and 90 in physics, and 18 in chemistry, you don't remember any of those. You remember that 35 even today. The schooling system encouraged individual excellence to the exclusion of collective excellence. So if you stood first in class and your best friend stood 27th in class, it didn't matter. Collaboration was not encouraged. Many of the behaviors that are embedded in us today found formation and fuel during the school years. And when you go back and meet your own school friends, you will all know that they have grown in body and time has passed, but the core has remained the same. The person has not really changed in any fundamental way. Therefore, in 1952, there was a scientist called Ivan Illich, and he wrote a book called De-Schooling Society. De-school. You want to transform society, you must re-school and de-school the way it has been trained so far. Emotional intelligence is very critical. There are many external reasons why we are not emotionally intelligent, including the reason that I might be egoistical. But there's one internal reason as well. And that has to do with the structure of the brain. If you look at a reptile, take a longitudinal section of the brain, it will look just like a dot and a straight line. If you jump millions of years of evolution and take a horse, take a longitudinal section of the horse's brain, you would notice that it contains the reptilian brain and a larger bulbous mass around it called the mammalian brain. Together, this is called the limbic system. The limbic system is a seat of powerful emotions and instincts. Powerful emotions, lust, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed, the limbic system. Instincts, fight, flight, freeze. In an instant. Now take many millions of years of evolution and take a human brain. A longitudinal section of the human brain will have a curved something on top called the neocortex. Inside that is the limbic system which contains mammalian and reptilian brain. This is the strongest argument in favor of Darwin's theory of evolution. Where inside my own brain is a mammalian and a reptilian brain. The neocortex grew very rapidly. Grew recently. In fact, it grew so rapidly, it didn't have time to integrate with the limbic system. Metaphorically, it is possible to hold the neocortex and peel it off. The neocortex, neo means new, cortex means brain. The neocortex is the seat of rationality. The neocortex, seat of rationality, the core part of the brain is emotionality and instinct. 
not integrated well. The schizophrenia between rationality and emotionality has a biological basis. It is there to stay. It is part of the human predicament. It is part of our own reality. When we are in a situation, hundreds and thousands and millions of years of conditioning gets us to operate instinctively. And yet a superior person is the one who is able to regulate his or her emotions and choose the responses that are optimal. That means an emotionally intelligent person is the one that can see the future implications of present actions so that you can tutor the actions. Not operate out of instinct. Not operate out of that gut feeling that you have. But to operate out of that which is thought through, imagined. If you look at the brain, lust, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed, if they are so bad, why are they there? According to Darwin's theory of evolution, they should have got squeezed out. What are the uses of lust? Envy, hatred, greed. The guy who said greed is good went to jail even in the movie. So why do you think these are there, these powerful emotions? Lust, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed, what are the uses of those? Survival. Survival? Any other reason? If you watch Animal Planet or National Geographic, you will notice that the animal is either eating or being eaten. Have you not all seen that poster that says that the slowest deer on that day must run faster than the fastest tiger to survive that day? Lust means more progeny. So even if a large number of individual creatures die, the species will survive. Nature is interested in the survival of the species. Morality, it's a social construct. Envy. If I'm envious and jealous, I know he's got fruits and nuts and he's gathered it from somewhere. I want to follow him. I want to steal it. It helped me survive. And I have internalized those attributes. Even today, your best friend who grew up with you in school, working for another organization, gets a great assignment. He's doing extremely well. And when you meet him, the first feeling you have is of jealousy. And you go to mask it. And you're embarrassed. Shouldn't be. Though over the feeling of envy, over the feeling of jealousy, over the feeling of anger, over the feeling of greed, you have no control. What you have control over is what you do about that emotion. So if somebody hits your car, instinctively you'll feel angry. Over that feeling of anger, no control. What you do about that anger? Maybe you get out of the car and you head towards the other person. I say, hope everything is fine. Maybe there was a lady holding a child in her arm. The head has slammed against the side, is bleeding, needs clinical attention. No, I got insurance. I mean, the headlight can be fixed, not a problem. What you originally felt and the behavior you demonstrated is emotionally intelligent because it is thought through, regulated, operating from a deliberately constructed internal stability, emotional stability. That's why in the ancient Indian philosophy, there's a premium on sthita, pragya, of stable consciousness. I think the Sankhya Yoga, almost 6,000 years old, has one of the better definitions of emotional intelligence. He says the world around you is turbulent. As you engage with the turbulent world, you become turbulent too. The speed and agility with which you come back to equipoise, to better engage with the turbulent world, is emotional intelligence. So entire array. So you can look at Ashtanga Yoga, eight steps of yoga. And at least if you look at India, emotional and spiritual intelligence are a continuum. In the Western world, spirituality is synonymous with religiosity. And there is a premium on secularism, being secular, not allow religion to come into your deliberate. And therefore, they have not hit upon our spiritual intelligence. Also, although there is a book called Spiritual Intelligence by Dana Zohar. And when the Western world comes to spiritual intelligence, it comes through the Buddhism route and invariably halts at the seven chakras, the Panchamaya Koshas, the Ashtanga Yoga. An interesting pursuit. But emotional intelligence is scientific, is measurable. It is possible to dip into you and say, at this stage, this is your emotional intelligence. These are your weaknesses. This is your core incompetence. You will deliver, you will fail because of this. And they can say it in a verifiable, predictable way. In fact, emotional intelligence is a significant, most serious predictor of future and sustainable success. You have two people equivalently competent, phenomenal background, 
And you want to know which of the two will be more successful? Well, put both of them through an emotional intelligence instrument that measures, and you'll be able to predict with a significant level of clarity. And at least one organization says that if you make your decision on the basis of my instrument, we will defend it in court. That is how sure they are about the science. So emotional intelligence is now scientific, measurable, verifiable, valid, reliable, predictable, can be used to make decisions. So lust, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed are struggling to manifest. The new cottage will regulate it. Originally when I had lust, I had a large number of progeny, it was good, it was good for survival. Now lust will be punitively met with. Society is saying the penal code, legal system, constitutional system, administrative system, therapies, religion, philosophy, teaching, guidelines, organizational values are all telling you that you must regulate what you originally feel and must fit into social normalcy. And therefore the idea of the bell curve. You know what the bell curve looks like, right? Can you imagine a bell curve? And the middle is the norm. You can deviate from the norm somewhat. If your behavior is at the tail end of the bell curve, it is abnormal. If your behavior is at the head end of the bell curve, it is abnormal. If your behavior is abnormal at the tail end, you'll go to the jail. If your behavior is abnormal at the head end, you'll go to the asylum. Therefore, emotional intelligence also has to do with social compliance, social acceptability, social inclusion and integratedness. Although George Bernard Shaw went ahead and said, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So the reasonable man is busy complying. But what is being said about the bell curve is that you must understand that the idea of social normalcy, you might instinctively feel a certain thing, its appropriateness is very critical. Our first criteria of emotional intelligence. Now, women staying back in the caves accidentally discover agriculture 20,000 years ago. It takes 12,000 years for agriculture to become systematic enough to prevent nomadic movement. So actually agrarian society started about 8,000 years ago. Agriculture requires fertility of soil, availability of water. So the moment you have good soil and water, you'll have a civilization come up. So all ancient civilizations are river civilizations. If there's a river and the water is perennial, it will encourage a civilization that comes up. 4,000 years ago, civilizations peaked and then began to decline. So for 8,000 years, you had what is called the agrarian phase. 300 years ago, metaphorically speaking, one person sitting in the kitchen, watching the kettle boil, mindlessly puts the spoon on the spout of the boiling kettle, and the spoon gets pushed. Who is this man? James Watt. Right? The steam engine. That has been seen metaphorically as the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So for 8,000 years you've had agrarian society, for 300 years you have an industrial society, and for the last 70 years you've had a technological society. And now the fourth paradigm is about to hit us. First paradigm was agrarian, industrial, post-industrial. Where do you think India is largely with society? In which one of the three waves is India largely in? A gradient, industrial, mix. Well, what percentage of Indian, Indian people are engaged in agriculture? So depending on who you believe, the statistics are a tough thing to come by in India. 59 to 71% is engaged in agriculture. India is the 12th largest industrial economy in the world, behind South Korea and Mexico in industrial output. And a wafer thin layer of India. What percentage of India has computers? 60? 50? 10? Yeah, closer to 3.5 percent. 3.5 percent of India has computers. So wafer thin layer. Although the wafer thin layer is contributing a large percentage of the GDP and maybe 59% is contributing 14% of the GDP. The demographic dividend is on very slippery grounds. 
So you have an industrial society, sorry, agrarian society, industrial society, post-industrial society. India largely exists in the agrarian society psychologically, exists in the post-industrial society chronologically. Is everybody with me? Psychologically agrarian, chronologically post-agrarian, post-industrial. There is a psychology-chronology dichotomy. If you think about the third wave, third wave, post-industrial, what are some of the attributes of this wave? What is it like? What is the environment like? Change. Rapidly. What else? Hmm? You control large parts. Of it. Control large parts of it. Technology driven. VUCA. They've called it VUCA, right? VUCA is volatile, volatile uncertain, uncertain ambiguous. ambiguous. So a lot of change. Unpredictability, uncertainty in the third wave. Unpredictably, uncertainty in the third wave. That's the environment we are operating in. If I were to put complexity on the x-axis, can you imagine a two by two matrix with me? On the x-axis, I will put complexity. On the y-axis, I will put change. Yeah, change, complexity. Low change, low complexity. High change, high complexity. You get a two by two, right? Everybody imagine that with me? Two by two. When the environment is low in change, low in complexity, don't worry. Go to the river, throw a net, pull the net. What comes out, cook part of it, trade the rest for rice. If the complexity is high, if the environment you're operating is a high complexity, but low change, what kind of capabilities do you need to be successful? High complexity, low change. You need supervisory and managerial skills to be successful. If you look at high change, but low complexity, things are changing extremely rapidly. Complexity is not much. To be successful, you will need entrepreneurial orientation, agility, quickness of response. So if you have high complexity, low change, you need managerial capability. If you have high change, you'll need entrepreneurial ability. What will you need if you have high change and high complexity? Emotional intelligence. Where your managerial capabilities are presumed and you have to build in an entrepreneurial ability. Initiative and calculated risk taking. What am I trying to establish? I'm trying to establish that chronologically we are in an environment of high change and high complexity and the way to succeed in this environment is emotional intelligence. And second challenge, of course, you are in an agrarian society. Now let's look at what comprises emotional intelligence. What are the dimensions of emotional intelligence? What do you think are the dimensions of emotional intelligence? Somebody said empathy, that's correct. Self-awareness. Self Self to be aware of oneself. Self Which means what? Self-regulation. Self Regulating your emotions, okay? Self-motivation, motivating yourself. Why is motivation in self? Isn't it motivation about motivating others? But we have to be motivated That's right. If you're motivated, you can be motivating. Very good. What else? Empathy. Ability to listen. Empathy. And then, then, social interaction. then social interaction. Yeah? Now you're telling me what Daniel Goldman is telling me. You tell me what you are telling me. What do you think? What are the other dimensions of emotional intelligence? Clarity of goal, yes. Mental and physical fitness. Mental and physical fitness. Tolerance, for ambiguity. Tolerance for ambiguity. Conflict. Managing conflict. You know, you use the very good word, management. Not conflict resolution, but conflict management. Hmm? Taking a stand. Flexibility. Poise. Hmm. So let's look at the value of emotional intelligence. There's a story that uh, after Vyasa finished writing the Mahabharata, now the Mahabharata is a very voluminous text. It is larger than the Odyssey and the Iliad put together, the two Greek epics. Very thick. After he finished writing it, the story is he gave it to other rishis for peer review. He said, can you review this and give me your feedback? Feedback is not only 20th and 21st century. 
even in BC, feedback. And he did a good, good, that's a good thing to do, because there must have been many rishis that are as great or greater than him, only they are not known. Because being known was not such a craving for people then. So they went through this. Then they came back and said, Vyasa, this is a phenomenal text. It is a civilizational contribution. But tell me, who is your TG? And Vyasa said, uh, TG? He said, yeah, target group. He said, oh, uh, well, all mankind. He says, really? Do you think all mankind is going to read this much to benefit from it? Vyasa, is it possible to create an executive summary? <laughs> and Vyasa says, yes, it is possible. The Vyasa made an executive summary, running into many pages. And he gave it to them. They went through the summary and says, this is good, this is good. This is the essence of the Mahabharata. But Vyasa, you know, frankly, this is also too much. Can you make it into one page? Vyasa said, yes, it can be done. And as Vyasa is going, from the behind, they say the one page, aerial font, 11 size, <laughs> one and a half spacing. He says, sure. And Vyasa gives a one pager. They read the one page and say, this is beautiful. This is superb. This is good. This is not the essence. It is the quintessence of the Mahabharata. But you know what, Vyasa? Can you reduce it to one shloka? And Vyasa says, yes, I can reduce it to one shloka. So he reduced it to one shloka. And he gave it to the rishis. And when the rishis looked at that shloka, and they read it, and it was so nuanced, and it was so deep, and it was so beautiful, that would suck you into a meditative trance. So deep would be the trance, so complete would be the engagement, that if you read it, you would enter in like Ratnakar and come out as Valmiki. Transforming power of one shloka. And then they looked at Vyasa and says, Vyasa, what a gem. But you know, most human beings do not have the psycho-spiritual maturity to engage with a shloka like this one. Vyasa, is it possible for you to reduce it to one word? And Vyasa says, yes. And that one word was paropakar. To do good to the others. You came with nothing. You will go with nothing. In the middle, what is this fuss about? What is this fuss about? All that you can really do is contribute. Wherever you are, whatever your capacity, give, do good to the others. And emotional intelligence and the literature on emotional intelligence actually is anchored on the philosophy and the principle of Parupakar, to do good to the others. Why should you know more about yourself? Why should you become more emotionally intelligent? All the benefit that accrues to you is the consequence of the pursuit of goodness for others. It is not the purpose. So fame, wealth, money, secure, all that is the consequence. It cannot be the purpose. If that becomes the purpose, then you have bastardized the real purpose. The real purpose is to give. Everything else is a consequence. So if you look at the dimensions of emotional intelligence, there are many models. There's one model my friend spoke here. Maybe I will take that model. There's another model I'll give you a handout for. So let's look at self-awareness. Self-awareness, Atma Jnana. No, you say Atma Jnana Pradhanena. Huh? Isn't the Guru Stotram beginning with that? Atma Jnana. To know more about myself. To know myself. And in emotional intelligence, when you say become self-aware, become aware, you're becoming aware of what? So self-awareness is, what are my strengths? What are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? What is a strength? So strength basically is, what are you good at doing? Or what you are best at doing? And to know your strength, I will put you in different situations and observe how you behave in those different situations. Trained professionals will observe you and they will say, these are his strengths. This is he does very well. He's able to collaborate, he's able to include, he's able to argue, he's able to persuade. He builds very strong bonds with others. But when it comes to detailedly planning and executing something, he doesn't do a good job. Strength, collaboration, inclusion, influence, weakness, detailed planning. Strength. So to know what your strengths are is very important. What do you think is a weakness? But before that, Knowing what you are good at doing is one part of strengths. Then there are hidden strengths. Hidden strengths are not visible to you, but visible to other people. 
others who observe you know what you are good at they say you know you speak so well i mean the way you analyze the problem is so superb you may not know it you you might think no no i'm just analyzing i think this is the way to analyze it's common sense ago so when others can see and you can't see it's a hidden strength and then you can't see and others can't see as potential strength potential that means one must know more and more of one's potential so that you can bring it to the conscious domain and use it what do you think is a weakness so a weakness in our definition ought to be something that adversely impacts your strengths your strengths are making you successful your weakness is that which adversely impacts your strength which means it holds back your strengths from full fruition is not you have very powerful pectoral muscles with two flaps of the wing you can hit the sky but what's nailing your feet to the floor what is that one thing or two thing that is holding you back and awareness of that is part of self awareness is it your ego is it your rigidity is it your brilliance so weakness is that which adversely impacts your strengths some people might say my work is so good my work is so perfect my work will speak for itself i don't need to be courteous and nice to other people i am doing my job won't work won't work so being aware of your strengths being aware of your weaknesses self awareness how you learn in an environment of change and complexity the most important ability is the ability to learn which presumes an ability to unlearn how do you learn there are many different learning styles and awareness of how i learn is part of self awareness because then i can tutor myself to learn like that some people learn by reading some people learn by writing you remember during your class 12 examination days some of your friends would close the door sit inside and then study 12 hours a day some friends just recopied the entire semester's notes again and simply by writing it out again they are ready for the exam some people studied in groups and they learned some people taught and when they were teaching the new less than the ones they were teaching and they learned different learning styles and awareness of what is your learning style if your learning style is reading if your learning style is discussing then you cannot be looking at a lot of harvard business review articles or other papers research papers it won't work because that's not your style if your style is listening and discussing then you must absolutely plan every quarter to attend a learning program that allows you to talk and discuss and use the case method because that's how you learn do you work well in large organizations do you work well in small organization do you work best alone do you work best in teams and awareness of that your personal excellence your personal productivity is a function of how you are doing best are you aware of the context and the nuances that gets you to work your best or are you continuously fighting many things and at the end of the day you are so tired and friday evenings you are overjoyous and monday morning you are suicidal see steve jobs has a speech to graduating students at stanford he says i stand in front of the mirror every day and ask myself this question if today was the last day in my life would i be doing what i'm about to do and when the answer is no for many days in a row i know it's time to change something you have no reason to lead anybody else's life but your own to do what you want to do what maslow called self actualization self actualization so when we say motivation motivation we mean internal intrinsic motivation the next thing is to be aware of what do you value what do you value value is not morals and ethics value as what do you consider uncompromisingly significant what do you value some people value money do you know in psychometric literature money is a value they'll work more they'll not what i am doing is what i'm getting for what i'm doing some people value security they want to be safe they want to be nice they joined this cooperative bank as a junior clerk they will retire as a senior clerk after them the son will get a job it is safe multinationals can come multinationals go go but i will remain here for ever 
Change is the only constant. No, no, change is your delusion. Constant is the only constant. <laughs> Nothing in my life has changed, including for 23 years, my wife has packed in the tiffin, curd rice, pickle. <laughs> and it has never tasted better. My wife is a magician when it comes to curd rice. Some people say I value learning. Some people say I value quality of life. Quality of life. My daughter will never be seven years old again or five years old again. I love holding her finger and going out for a walk. I walk and suddenly she stops and says, Papa. And I say, yes, baby. And she points in the direction of a long cylindrical pipe rushing into the sky, belching smoke. I say, baby, it's called a chimney. And she says, chimney. Now for the first time, I'm re-looking at the chimney. It is too beautiful. The wonders of the world that were lost to my dull eyes are now being relived through the innocent first impressions eyes of my daughter. I want to go back home first. No, no, I don't want to stay back. I don't want to climb the corporate ladder. I want to spend time with wife, with child. I want to leave early, I want to come back early. Spend time with them. Value quality of life. Somebody else says, my salary could be one-fifth of your salary, but when I walk into the room, everybody stands. When I stand outside, the whole environment arranges itself in deference to me. I'm an IPS officer. This person values power, values recognition, doesn't value money, doesn't value security, doesn't value quality of life. Learning. Some people value freedom, autonomy, to be independent. I don't want to report to anybody. I don't want a performance appraisal where I'll be giving developmental feedback. If I go do one leadership program, they'll say, huh, what do you learn from it? Huh, what are you going to apply? How will you measure your improvement? <laughs> don't send me for any leadership program. Leadership is too tiring. You want to be by myself, autonomous, independent, not reporting to anybody else. Not continuously wanting to, know. like Osho used to say, when I was a child, everybody was trying to improve me. Continuously. I was their Kaizen project. <laughs> Incremental improvement. Bal lampe kyo hai? Chodi ka? Aise kyo baitho? Haath hata? Sida baitho? Autonomy, independence. Don't want people to tell me what to do, how to do, whether to go, whether to come finds the organizational life too, too asphyxiating. If a person goes to the boss and says, boss, I just wanted two days off, can I have it? The boss says, no. Okay, I was just trying my luck. <laughs> <laughs> See, because if you give Wednesday, Thursday off, Friday is Ram Naomi, Saturday, Sunday is off, Monday is Eid, Tuesday is go, go, I mean, that whole nine days, I'll get it off. <laughs> nine days off. Nine days off? What all can I not do with the nine days off? The person who values freedom is saying, hold on a minute. The fact that I was born means I'm going to die. In the intervening lifetime, I don't have a locus standi and jurisdiction on my own time? What are you giving me? I am giving you the best hours of the day. I am giving you the best years of my life. What are you giving me in return? A salary? I think the equation is in fundamental and violent imbalance. Because I value freedom. A part of self-awareness is what do you value? What do you value? Can you introspect? It is a tough one to crack. Sigmund Freud used to say that in individualistic societies like United States, Germany, what you value will become clear to you by the time you're 28 or 30 years old. Because you started at 18. You left home, mocked your hair. Punctured your ears, nose, throat, tongue, lips, anything else that could be punctured. Worked at Red Lobster, Starbucks, whatever, chilies. Gathered some money, went to look at Egypt. Then went snorkeling. Then went scuba diving. Then you saw some ruins there and now you're interested in marine archaeology. <laughs> trial and error, more error than trial. You found it. The love of your life. Ancient rocks speak to you like nobody else does. What do you value? What do you really value? 
In collectivistic societies, Freud said, you will have clarity on what you value by the time you're 40 or 45 years of age. Because in collectivistic societies, what you value is what the father figure values, is what the family values, is what the society values. Social and filial values osmotically filter in to become your values. And monomaniacally in a slumber, you lead that life. By the time you're 40 or 45, the psychological dominance of the father figure, who's generally the father, is reducing because he's ill, unwell, dying, or dead. And from that, the psychological dominance goes, and you have to have clarity on what do I want to do? So far, I have done dharma. What about swadharma? What about pursuit of personal aspirations and desires to the exclusion of social compliance, legitimacy, and duty? But at 45, your relatives will come rushing in. Wait, wait. What are you trying? Can you see this face of your daughter? You were trying to do this. And you look at the face of your daughter, and the daughter is looking, Papa. <laughs> and then you will say, ah. In life, I have stepped forward so much that going back to restart would be as tedious. Excellence is a function of abilities, aspirations, and values in alignment, not malignment. So there is a legitimacy, social legitimacy. The duty that you will do to wife, child, mother, parents, society, organizations, government of India is duty, legitimacy. And then there is authenticity, the pursuit of personal goals. Legitimacy, authenticity. When Siddhartha at night wants to leave home and go, a child has just been born called Rahula. One meaning of Rahul is the moon, the other meaning of the Rahul is shackles. So when Rahul is born, Siddhartha says, oh, a Rahula is born, with shackles, another shackle. I tried to get rid of one called wife. Now another one has come. <laughs> Tougher. But one night he decides. Enough is enough. Social duties, family duties, legitimacy. He gets up. And he walks out of the door. And he reaches for the horse. And he gets up on the horse. And as he gets up on the horse, gods from the heavens descend, rush down with cotton in their hand, and put it under the hooves of the horse. Just in case if the horse gallops and makes noise, Yashodara will come out and say, Siddhartha, where are you going? It's night. Siddhartha, fundamentally being compassionate, will return. What seems like legitimacy is authenticity. At the altar of authenticity, legitimacy can be sacrificed. A swadharma, purushottama. Purusha, man. Purushottama, superior amongst men. Therefore, emotional intelligence in the question of values explores the question of authenticity. The pursuit of personal desires, where ability, aspirations, and values are aligned, and therefore effort is effortless. Anything that takes too much effort is not worth it. There's a book in the market called Switch, written by Dan and Chip Heath. Switch. There he talks about willpower. And he says, willpower is a limited resource. Itna hi hai. If you put it in this, then you can't put it in that. Another book in the market, very good book, that says the one thing. At any given point of time, you can do one thing. Willpower is a limited resource. And they did an experiment. Experiment was they took a group of people and says, here's a problem, solve it. And here is a bowl of chocolates, don't touch. And next to it is a bowl of radish. You can eat as much as you want. Everybody knows it's an experiment, even though they know it's an experiment. Another group, give them a problem to solve. A bowl of chocolate. They say, have it if you feel like having it. The author says that the problems in both cases are the same. The problems are basically not solvable. That means what you are testing is not the solution, but how long before you give up? And in experiment after experimenting with groups after groups, they notice that the group that had to have used the willpower to not eat the chocolate when they felt like it, gave up up to 39% earlier than the other group. 
So if you start dieting and you start running and you start exercising and it's taking all your willpower to get up at 5.30 a.m., be sure that other aspects of the life that requires willpower will get compromised. And you should be able to rationalize that in the short run, I need to pay the price only to take advantage in the long run. What do you value? If you have clarity on what you value, then know where you belong. Then you know where you belong. This is where I belong. Oh, are you still floating your resume to, immig uh, to get another job? Still looking at immigrating to Canada, Australia, whichever country will take you without beating you up? Or oh, you know this is where I belong. The best hours of the day, every single day of my life will be here. And if you know where you belong, then you know, have clarity on what is that incredible contribution you're going to make to society. An emotionally intelligent person is a Purushottama, superior amongst men. And at least in ancient Indian thinking, the Purushottama is also Ardha Nari Ishvara. Ardha Nari Ishvara. Man and woman in perfect harmonic balance. So when you say self-awareness, what do we mean? Now we know what we mean by self-awareness. I know what my strengths are. I know what my hidden strengths are. I am open to explore my potential. I know which environment I work best in. I know whether I'm a lone ranger, lone performer, or a group performer. If I'm a lone performer, then I'll take more and more assignments that allow me to perform low, alone while building a threshold level of capability in collaboration. If I'm someone who pathologically needs groups to be productive, then I must build capability for autonomous, independent work. So clarity on what my self-awareness is. How do I read? How do I study? How do I learn? How do I unlearn? What do I value? A question always is, do values change? The easy answer is yes. The right answer is no. Sigmund Freud says your values got formed by the time you were six years old. Jean Piaget and Maria Montessori said, no, not six, it's closer to seven. The latest theoreticians, the many psychometric instruments say it's closer to 14. In any case, your values got formed long before you had any locus standi on what value is the one you want to choose. Therefore, what do I value is an exploration and a reflection. And only you will know what you value. Otherwise, you say, no, no, in school I valued good marks. In college, I valued looking good. Now I value money and security. Later on, I'll value achievement. So it keeps changing for me. No, no, no. Maybe you value security. Good marks was proof that you're secure. Looking good was proof that you're secure. Getting good money is proof that you're secure. Being famous, liked, and admired is proof that you're secure. So you got to explore what is it that I value and align that value with your ability and aspirations. Almost all leadership derailment has to do with when your aspirations are in excess of your ability. The other dimension is self-regulation. Regulation. Third is motivation. Fourth is empathy. empathy. Fifth is social skill. Self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, social skill. Now that we are at empathy, let us look at empathy. Empathy means getting into the shoes of the other. To get into the shoes of the other, you need to get out of your shoes. Now the real definition of empathy in emotional intelligence is not only being able to get into their shoes and understand where their pain points and concerns are, but being able to articulate it. And in the third stage, my behaviors must accommodate that articulation. Number one, I must sense what the pain is. Supposing it is 2 a.m. in the morning. My teenage daughter is studying late into the night. She's all worried. She's doing that math. She doesn't have a mind for quantitative, but she's struggling. The next day is an exams. And I just got up to drink some water, and I look at her. I said, baby, what are you doing? I go, I just want this. I said, econometric paper. I said, you know what? Don't worry so much about it. Do your best, and that's good enough. And if you haven't given it attention during the year, give it attention in the next part. But don't stress yourself like this. Scene one, I see she's struggling like this, I say so. Then I go. In emotional intelligence, that is not empathy. Simply because I understood that she's going through pain is not empathy, does not count. If you have it, show it. 
Just love in your heart won't do, it won't manifest. So going there and articulating it to her. And then the rest of your behaviors must accommodate that articulation. So next day morning, if you've woken up and at 7 o'clock you open her door, she's still sleeping. You say, what the hell are you doing? Your exam today, you're still sleeping. Is this how you'll succeed? Get the hell out of this car. I'm paying. Which school are you going to? Do you have an idea of which school? What is your annual fee? Nine lakhs. Who's paying it? I'm paying it. What the hell are you sleeping for? <laughs> not only must you sense it, not only must you express it, your subsequent behaviors must accommodate that expression. Now it is empathy. So what is the operating skill in empathy? If you want to become more empathic, what skill should you have? Observant. Observer. And? Listener. Listener. Listening is the operating skill in empathy. Listen. Listen to content. Listen to intent. Listen to what is not being said. And listening to what is not being said is observation. Listen to content, listen to intent, listen to what is not being said. Listen, listen, listen. There's a Zen story on listening. Are you familiar with Zen? Zen is a form of Buddhism practiced in Japan. So in Sankhya Yoga, you have the word Dhyana. Dhyan. Since I'm speaking in English, it'll become Dhyana. Dhyana. Patanjali took dhyana and made it part of Ashtanga Yoga. Eight steps of yoga, eight limbs of yoga. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharna, Dhyana, Samadhi. Dhyana, Samadhi. Samadhi is not the trance that you will get into. Samadhi means that critical insight that challenges your operating assumption and has the power to change behavior. So when Gotama is walking and he sees a dead body, he sees a medicant, he sees an ill body, that challenges his operating assumptions and gives him an insight. And that insight changes his behavior. He's going to walk out that night. So Samadhi, anything that gets you to challenge your operating assumptions, so Samadhi has the power to transform behavior. Transformed behaviors lead to transformed actions. Transformed actions lead to transformed outcomes. So Dhyana is a very critical part. When Dhyana traveled Buddha, he took Dhyana and made it part of many of his practices, of which Vipassana is the most known, right? When Buddhism went to China, they don't have the alphabet Dha, it became Chana. When Chana traveled to Japan, it became Zana. Zana became Zen, and Zen became Kaizen. What is Kaizen? Continuous incremental improvement. Continuous incremental improvement. Take one particular thing and incrementally improve it until it reaches perfection. And uh, how will you know what to improve and how to improve? By listening to what is not being said and by observing the pain points and challenges that others are experiencing. Where do you fit dhyana and samadhi in the corporate world? Does it, is it required? Or is it, it is always required. But let's look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Everybody familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Abraham Maslow said that people have certain needs. And only when lower level needs are fulfilled can you go to the next level. Supposing you are hungry and you are malnourished and I come to you, Sarva Dharman, Parityajya, Mamekam, Sharanam Raja. I say, what the hell? So once food and fornication are taken care of, next is I want to be safe. I want to be safe. Then I want to belong somewhere. Part of my identity. I belong somewhere. Then there is ego level need. Ego. Ahankar. Sigmund Freud used to say ego is useful because ego is identity. Ego is me. I am important. I, Rajeshwar, am good. When I take up something, I will do it well. That is ego. The problem is egotism or egoism. And the difference between egotism, egoism and ego is one is Swabhiman, the other is Ahankar. Ego in the organization. Next to ego is self-esteem. Self-esteem is, in sentiment it is ego. So in ego you say, I did it, I succeeded, under me the organization has become so big. In esteem you say, we succeeded, we did it together. No, I couldn't have done it alone. The assignment is too large. 
There are too many people, right people at the right time came and therefore it happened. So it becomes we. The last part is self-actualization. Right from food and fornication needs, safety needs, belonging needs, ego needs, esteem needs, the motivators are external. Which means by tweaking the motivator, I can tweak your motivation. Simply by making your subordinate, your senior, I can make your life miserable starting today. Ek chitti aajayega haath mein, you are required to report to Abhimanyu. Hey, which Abhimanyu? Sinha? Sinha you only, no? Who else? Self-actualization, the motivation has shifted internal. That means no matter what you do to the external motivator, my motivation will not shift. That's why Gandhi says, you can beat me. You can throw me into prison. You can kill me. That way you will have my dead body, not my obedience. Because you're operating from self-actualization. Supposing there is fear that you'll get beaten, you will comply. The fear that you'll get thrown into jail, you'll comply. But your motivation is intrinsic. So when you're motivated intrinsically, that is self-actualization. And I must tell you, organizations are not spaces for self-actualization. Organizations are spaces for you to climb up to esteem so that te na takte na bunji tha, jino ne bhoga, unho ne hi tyaga. To go to Swadharma, you should have done enough dharma. <laughs> Otherwise, Buddha will walk back like Vishwamitra did, right? Vishwamitra did his sannyasa a little early in the day. So he's sitting in meditation and Menaka comes along. I said, well, it's not a bad idea, right? <laughs> but he has to detour. So only after you have... So organizations are basically largely spaces of ego and esteem. Ego and esteem. Therefore, actualization will happen in the places of non-organizations. And that is your pursuit. And in the Indian worldview, early stages of life, Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya has many things, but the most important part is learning how to acquire. Grihastha ashrama, acquiring. So Dharma Shastra, Niti Shastra, Artha Shastra, Kama Shastra are all parts of Grihastha ashrama. And then there is Vanaprastha. Just as you spend 20 years learning how to acquire, now spend 25 or 25 years learning how to give up. Vanaprastha. And then there is sannyasa. In the ancient Indian worldview, the final pursuit is going away. Sannyasa. And it is your final pursuit means you can go there from Brahmacharya, you can go there from Grihastha, and you must go there from Vanaprastha. Don't loop back into Grihastha Ashram after Vanaprastha. Therefore, in our worldview, the movement is in another direction, and authenticity is a pursuit that cannot happen within the elements of the organization. How to measure your value? First, how to identify it? So reflection, mananam, looking at your past, looking at what energizes you. Look at what fatigues you, look at what energizes you. The new literature on strength is, strength is anything that energizes you even if you're not good at doing it. Weakness is anything that fatigues you even if you're good at doing it. So what energizes you? What makes you alive? It's self-awareness or courage. Courage. Jada hona padega. See, there are so many gods and goddesses in India. How many are there? 330 million gods and goddesses. At one point of time, we had one god per person. In the meanwhile, we have multiplied and made gods the minority. And it seems we are doing better. Not only we have so many gods and goddesses, each of the gods and goddesses are multiple arms. Avaloki Deshwara has 10,000 arms. Chank, Chakra, Gada. Regardless of what they are doing with the other hands, one hand is always in this posture. Abhaydanam. The gift of fearlessness. The difference between you and me exists only in your mind. Have courage. Step forward. When in doubt, do. And as you do more, think more, you'll get clarity on what you value. But a simpler way is, there are psychometric instruments that look at all the 11 values I spoke of just now. I didn't speak of hedonism. 
and altruism are the two values, 11 values. You do that instrument and you'll get high scores in three or four of them. So, come say, come, you have to to aage, abhi ke mein socho. Now, reflect which of these three is what your value is, what you really value. That's how you can come closer. But it's a tough exploration. So, self awareness, self regulation means you would tend to operate from the limbic system. Lust, anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, greed, regulate it. Regulate it. Think of future implications and then. And then act. Think through and act. So if your boss tells you, come here, I just want to discuss something. I say, yes, boss, I'm saying. He says, what are you talking about? Nonsense. You're stupid or what? You have 20 years experience. <sighs> over the feeling of humiliation, you don't have control. What you have control over is what you do about the humiliation. But boss, why do you think the idea is not good? Look, it's not a But how regulate it? Because A, B, and C, I don't think you've considered this. Then it might occur to you the idea is stupid. Or it might occur to you, you didn't express it well. Let me give you another example. We remained in the dialogue. Both Walt Disney and eBay in the organizational competency framework have a competence called executive presence. And at least for Walt Disney, executive presence has three indicators. Number one, ability to listen completely so that you can understand. The purpose of listening is deeper understanding, not solving the problem. The solving the problem is a consequence. Have you understood? Not all problems can be solved. You know that. But have you understood? Second, ability to present persuasively to an audience. Second indicator of executive presence. Third one, comfort in the presence of seniors, not awkwardness and deference. Comfort in the presence of seniors. Not awkwardness and deference. Kitna satik hai in the case of India. Where seniors are anyway called superiors. He's my superior. If he's your superior by comparison, what are you? Superior. There's another caste system operating then. So senior is not necessarily superior. Senior is senior because he was born earlier than you. If you were born 10 years ago, then he was your junior. So seniors are not necessarily superior. Awkwardness and deference, no. Remain in the dialogue. Have comfort. Dialogue is equal and assert. So the operating skill in self-regulation is assertiveness. Is assertiveness. Not fight, not flight. Fight is instinctive, flight is instinctive. When between stimulus and response, there is thinking. Then there is response. When there is thinking, it is called assertive. Whenever between stimulus and the response, there is thinking. Krodh aya, aega. But how you regulated it? Whatever you felt humiliated, how did you regulate it? You felt jealous, how did you regulate it? Regulated with assertiveness. And the definition of assertiveness is the following. And I think it's a golden definition. Just like the definition of empathy is a superior definition. Assertiveness is you must express yourself. Don't be quiet. Don't keep quiet. You must express yourself. You must express your thoughts. You must express your feelings. You must express your values. But do it in a socially acceptable, non-abusive, non-destructive way. I can disagree with you. I cannot disrespect you. So in assertiveness, in listening, there is listening. And then there is asserting. And in assertiveness, you must express your thoughts, feelings, and values but in a socially acceptable, non-destructive, non-abusive way. Therefore, listening and asserting are symbiotic skills. Empathy and self-regulation are symbiotic skills. Intra and inter are symbiotic skills. The purpose of listening is to deepen understanding, so the quality of asserting is superior. Therefore, there are three axioms to listening. Axiom one, listen first. Don't talk first. There's some management thumb rule that says, don't be the smartest guy in the room. Keep quiet. Axiom one, listen first. Axiom two, when the other is asserting, listen. Even if the other is wrong. Because you want to understand how come he's wrong. So when the other is asserting, listen. When the other is listening, assert. And axiom three, the quality of assertiveness is predicated on the quality of listening. The more you listen, the better you listen, the superior will be your response. 
Therefore means from today onwards, nobody should ever tell you, no, no, I haven't finished. Don't interrupt. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. No, 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 you're putting words in my mouth. They should never say this because the quality of your listening is so superior. Therefore, regulate yourself. Listen first. When the other is asserting, listen. When the other is listening. Because if the other is asserting and you are asserting, it's a match of decibels and designations. There's no dialogue here. When the other is asserting, listen. When the other is listening, assert. And axiom three, the quality of assertiveness is dependent on the quality of listening. Quality of assertiveness is dependent on the quality of listening. So listen, listen, listen. In the ancient Indian thinking, the one who listened more. So if you are listening, what are you not doing? You are not speaking. You are not talking. You are in Mauna. Anybody who is in a Mauna is a Muni. And when the Muni opens his mouth, what comes out is a mantra. That means he's kept quiet for so long. He's observed so completely. He has that brilliant insight. And from that insight, when he utters it, it is a mantra. So the man who first said, Jagan Mithya, Brahma Satya. And the Guru would have told him, Brahma Satya, Jagan Mithya. It's only when you've woken up, then you can say that I was dreaming. In the dream, you cannot say I'm dreaming. A mantra, which means your most brilliant insights, your cutting edge capabilities, what makes you a superior thinker and a superior person is your ability to shut up. A linear correlation. The more you keep quiet, the better you will become. But you must express yourself. If both people become quiet, then what happens? Especially in an organizational context, if you're willing to listen but the other is not speaking, and you're also not speaking, which means trust is not in place. It's no longer a listening issue, it's a trust issue. Last time when he spoke, it was misused by others or maybe by you. So this time when he says, yeah, tell me I'm all listening, I'm all ears, he's not willing to tell you. So the trust has to be healed before listening can happen. So emotional intelligence, self-awareness. You know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, you know what you value, you know where you belong, you know what contribution you're going to make. Self-regulation, operating skill is asserting. Motivation, intrinsic. Empathy, get into the other person's shoes, articulate it, and your behavior should accommodate the article. Social skill has three components. One, networking. Networking. I know many people are thinking networking is so bastardized. But networking means the pursuit of relationships based on mutually benefit and mutually satisfying. Mutually beneficial, mutually satisfying. You want to network with the CEO, why would the CEO network with you? Because you're working on a project that is critical to him. So the purpose of networking is to build relationships based on common interests, common grounds and mutuality. <coughs> Unless you are clear, there is a book in the market that says go-giver. Go-giver. Go Not go-getter. The go-getter is passe, the go-getter is a fool. The go-giver. I'm interested, what can I do for you? How can I give you more in value than I'm charging you in money? How can I focus on making it better for you? If I focus on giving, the getting is default. If I focus on getting, the giving suffers. The go-giver. Empathy. So social skill, networking. Mutuality of benefit. Continuously thinking, how can I help you? How can I serve you? What, how can I be of use? What can I do for you? Is there something you need that I can help? That is the sentiment in the mind. Networking. The second one is appreciative orientation. Not critical, contemptuous, derogatory, negative, pessimistic, sarcastic, appreciative. Doesn't mean foolish. Appreciative. What's good in you? What's good in the situation? What a lovely day. Appreciative orientation. And third one, personal branding and visibility. Personal branding and visibility. The textbook in most MBA schools on organization behavior is written by Fred Luthens. In the last five years, Fred Luthens has added a chapter called Impression Management. Managing the impression you're creating on others is a critical part of a leader's role and a legitimate part of academic research. Most organizations will say, no, 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 it is too critical a matter to be left to you. We will do it for you. Here is a 360 degrees feedback. 
managing the impressions you're creating on others. For example, the question is, spends adequate time developing subordinates? Self-rating, five. Huna? Main huna? Always I tell them, main huna? Thanks to Shah Khan, he's given me one line or I can say, main huna? Seniors, seniors are saying, I don't know, he keeps shouting very abusive to them, he's always shouting at them. Kuch to karta hai, the team is performing three. A scale of one to five. Peers are saying, you know, half the time they, uh, they come to me complaining about him. Here be three. Subordinates, two. Now you'll get a bar chart. Supposing there are 36 questions in 360 degrees, the bar chart. Spends adequate time developing subordinates. Self rating, five. Subordinate rating, two. And sometimes you're asking, is ink khatam ho gaya? Kya hai? Baki kidhar gaya? <laughs> now when you see it, it brings you, makes you more aware of the impression that you're having on your subordinates. Maybe you're not doing or showing enough. So, social skill, networking, appreciative orientation, personal branding and visibility. Clear? We have a film clip there. Can we just, this is a film clip taken from a movie called Invictus. The story of Nelson Mandela who's come out of prison after 27 years. Okay. Yes, so what do you see in this clip? See, he spent 27 years in prison. The first day he's coming, he's not all dazed. He notices everything. He's observant. Nobody's submitting a statistics to him saying how many people have left, etc. He notices. On the basis of that observation, he makes a deduction. On the basis of that deduction, he decides to take an action straight away. There is ministers and cabinet and all that, but a great leader is the one who knows the big thing as big and the small thing as small. Postponing the meeting with these big people is small. Letting these people go is big. And he observes and at once decides that call everybody. I could not help noticing the empty offices and all of the packing boxes. So if you look at as he comes to the people, even as he comes, there's one appreciation. You know, we said appreciative orientation. One appreciation. Ah, Brenda, you had your head. I like it. Absolutely at ease flows from him. And as he's heading towards the room, one of the person says, yeah, he wants the satisfaction of firing us himself. But when he comes, he's walking that distance. And by the time he walks that distance, what does he say? Good morning, everybody. Good morning to you. How are you this morning? So good to see you. He's changing the energy and the anxiety in the room so quickly. So by the time he comes here, the first sentence he says, what's the first sentence? Thank you for coming on such short notice. He's not saying, I'm the president. If I call you, you will crawl and come. You don't even have to walk. But thank you for coming on such short notice. You know, I had somebody who just wrap you up. I, I, I mean, you might be busy with so many. Thank you. Some of you may know who I am. I could not help noticing. Now, if you want to leave, that is your right. And the three things he knows. He's saying, if you think the color of your skin, your language, or who you worked for before. Because in their mind they are thinking, you know, black people are coming to power, I am white. I worked for the previous regime, and the ruthlessness and the efficiency behind the ruthlessness of the previous regime came from administrative people like us. And the language we speak is different. We will never be wanted over here. And he empathizes, which means he understands, gets into their shoes. When you get into the other person's shoes, it's a metaphor, you now know where the shoe pinches. Their shoe is pinching in three places. And he articulates it. Otherwise, in just two minutes of talking, you cannot change people's facial expression from stress, anxiety, dismay, concern to this. If you think these things disqualify you, I am here to tell you. Who am I? I am the president of South Africa. In South Africa, beyond me, there is God. I am here to tell you openly and publicly, have no such fear. Why? The past is the past. We look to the future. For going to the future, I cannot carry the baggage of the past. Therefore, no need to leave. But there's an expectation. Where is the point where he asserts? The one point he asserts? Can't work, get out. Yeah. If you feel in your heart you cannot work with your new government, these guys are black, they are stupid, they are illiterate, they are well, not very well behaved, they stink when they talk, they talk with their mouth, oh my God, it's terrible, I can't bear to be with them. If that be in your heart, it is better that you do leave. When? Right, right away. So there is assertiveness and there is empathy. 
when he has an expectation, he clarifies the expectations. He has such a short speech. He has an expectation. He tells them what my what is the expectation? All I ask you work to the best of your ability. Just give me your best. Don't give me your second best. Work to the best of your ability and with good heart. Don't stay back because of the pension, the housing allowance, the car allowance, the travel allowance. If you do that, then every coffee machine, lunch break canteen, you'll be bitching about the government. Don't do that. Work to the best of your ability and with good heart. And the second part of the equation is, I promise, president can't use the word so loosely, I promise to do the same. And then if we can manage that, you do that part and I do this part, then our country will be a shining light. Let's look at the EQ framework for him. Self-awareness. Now, Clint Eastwood didn't make, it, make this movie for classroom use. If you are sitting here, he would say, Raj, what the hell are you doing with my movie? <laughs> Self-awareness. Does he know his strengths and weaknesses? Does he know what he values? Does he know where he belongs? Does he know what contribution he needs to make? Absolutely. High self-awareness. Self-regulation. Is he assertive? Motivation. Is he inspired and inspiring? Empathy, does it deeply connect with the people? Social skill, does it networking, common ground? Appreciative orientation, that we need your help. We want your help. I need it, I want it. So in a, such a small clipping, you can see emotional intelligence and demonstration. Now think about the greatness of this man. When he's coming into that space, he's saying what? People have left and gone. They know I am coming and they are not here. Who are the people who are not here? Give me their names. Bring them right here. I am going to have action against them. Instead he is saying, no, 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 stay back. Want you, need you. Without you the country will not be a shining light. When these people are going back, they are at once making calls to Jack and Jill and whoever be. No, 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 come back. It's very different. He really wants us to work here. Emotional intelligence in action is an example. It's almost biographical. Now, I have a few things to give you. One is Daniel Goldman's article, What Makes a Leader? Emotional intelligence makes a leader because it is a significant predictor of future and sustainable success. Sustainable success is not that you became successful because the government regulation changed. Not that you became successful because the price of plastic dropped. Sustainable success, not episodal success. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I greatly enjoyed interacting with you. I thank you very much and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.